June had come to Worcester, Massachusetts. The date was June the 9th, the year 1953. And the city, with its more than 200,000 people and surrounding Worcester County, were ending a normal day. It was late afternoon. But up in the North County, a tragedy was brewing. It couldn't happen, but it did. A tornado born to rip a path of death through central Massachusetts, 45 miles through Petersham, Barry, Rutland, Holden, Worcester, Shrewsbury, Westboro, and Fayville. And the city and the towns began to count their dead. And the toll went to 85, then even higher. When the tornado struck into Worcester, it roared through one of the city's most populated areas, Great Brook Valley Gardens and Curtis Apartments. Two major housing projects where 3,800 people lived. The 3,000 of them were home that afternoon. And these are the people who lived down in the valley right after the tornado struck. Nearly a thousand police and auxiliaries moved into Worcester right after the disaster, including 40 out-of-town cruiser cars. Outside communities sent 30 ambulances and panel trucks, and firemen were there, too. Here, the Worcester firemen fight ablaze. Later, auxiliary departments from other communities sent lighting equipment. 400 nurses answered the call. There was suffering at Great Brook Valley in Curtis Apartments. The children, nowhere to go, gathered in groups. And here, the long walk out of the shattered housing projects. The little ones, dazed and clinging to their parents. And across the ground everywhere, live wires, danger, death. And the long walk went on. Cars were wrecked. People standing shocked and stunned. This car, it still ran, carrying injured to ambulances. And here the total wreckage. Great Brook Valley Gardens cost seven million dollars. Curtis Apartments, four and a half million dollars wrecked. Trailers were brought in to house some of the displaced. Housing Authority Chairman Raymond Harold and Executive Director Joseph Benedict predicted some families would be back in the projects in about a month. A section of Worcester's Upper Burncoat Street was blasted. The early arrival of the National Guard made looting almost non-existent. A two-family home, a total wreck, and the dazed occupants sift through the wreckage, looking for their belongings. Something of the homes they knew, the little things that meant so much at a time like this. The telephone among the 9,500 knocked out in the area. And a piece of sheet music in the rubble, but unlike the title, June brought not roses, but tragedy to central Massachusetts. Off Uncatina Avenue and Clark Street, more homes were devastated, and more people searched through them, sifting through that unbelievable wreckage for just a few short moments before they lived. Nothing like this ever happened to any of these people before. Most of them thought it could never happen to them. The young, the middle-aged, the old, they all were hit alike. This couple, so typical, lost their home, lost years of work, lost everything. At the end of this June 9th, they didn't even have a roof over their heads. These and other people needed help, and they got it. The Red Cross, Salvation Army, Civil Defense, the Worcester Housing Authority, and church and civic groups swung into action, protecting, ministering, helping out in every way. Holden Street in Worcester. The search for bodies and belongings continues here. Many people were unaccounted for, for hours, for days. 
Appeals were broadcast as mothers tried to reach their children, husbands to get in touch with wives, out-of-towners with those they knew in the disaster area, and here another job for the National Guard. Not only did they protect the property of the stricken people, but they also lent a hand in salvaging such items as this furnace pulled out of a rubble-filled cellar, a furnace which might one day be used again. And here a Red Cross worker talks to a stunned, bewildered victim. Winthrop Oaks in Holden, the first large prefabricated development in New England, devastated. These homes costing on an average of $9,000 each were largely blown away. Only 13 out of 57 were left standing when the wind had passed. But they didn't splinter. They blew away in pieces, in sections, as they were erected and not a resident of this area was killed. The phone lines were down here as elsewhere, but throughout the disaster area, work on restoring service rushed ahead. Red Cross volunteers started working early, and they stayed late. In some cases, the injured received treatment from high school girls. The girls trained by the Red Cross just a short time before in first aid techniques. Training that proved invaluable once the tornado struck. And the National Guard was in this area too, protecting damaged and open property. Only shells remained of what once were homes. This was a beautiful fireplace in a modern living room. It stood, the room was gone. Furniture exposed as it stands in rooms minus walls, some furniture lying smashed upon the ground outside the homes in which it stood. At this home, pots and pans were salvaged from a stove that was still fastened to the foundation of the house. Residents took with them all they could. They lived where they could, with what they had. And this man salvaged something seemingly unimportant. A golf club. We'd guessed, though, that that swing felt good, a reminder of the way Things were so short a time ago. Cars took a beating from the wind. This one was tossed several hundred feet, and the owners set out to look at it. A walk over what once was yard to the resting place of the battered auto. This one had some change in a box in the glove compartment. The money was later found scattered on the ground. The fact that the door would open was something. And inside, a blanket that might serve someone as a cover for that night. The winds just wiped wide areas clean, made out of this neat development a wood-strewn field. Even the trees were stripped of leaves and bark. They looked as they do in midwinter or after a forest fire.